The 20th century was a time of incredible change, unspeakable horrors, and amazing leaps of scientific discovery. It was a century marked by events that united and divided us, from great feats to great wars, with advancements and setbacks that showed us the power of many, the power of one. A century of revolutions, evolutions, and retributions. A century made by conflicts and crimes, inventions and entertainment, politics, protests, discoveries, and disasters. We will count down the 101 events of the 20th century. Their stories form the tapestry of our history and shape the world in which we live. In this episode... It's the first time really the whole of the population were drawn into the business of war. But it created also a broader accessibility to culture. It created an early form of our information society. It completely transformed our understanding and expectations of life and death. Nineteen sixties America was a new Camelot, a time of regeneration and expansion, a nation looking with hope to the future and out to the stars. But that dream would be shattered on a sunny afternoon in Dallas, Texas. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was young, smart, charming, and he had a young family of his own. He brought the American people a sense that they were being listened to and represented in his short presidential term. Firstly, of course, uh, he is a very charismatic president. He succeeds Eisenhower, who was the oldest man to have held office at that time, uh, and he himself is the youngest elected president. So it's a symbolic passing of the torch between generations. Uh, Kennedy promises a kind of new leadership. Everywhere he went, crowds gathered to see the man who held a world's weight lightly on young shoulders. The events on the 22nd of November, 1963, left the American people reeling. They lost their president in a very public shooting. During a motorcade through Dallas, the local residents were filming the excitement as John and Jacqueline Kennedy drove through the streets. They caught the action on film. Its bumpy nature depicts the shocked reaction of the one holding the camera. Kennedy falls forward in the convertible, and his panicked wife tries to help her fallen husband. Taken to hospital, the president was pronounced dead 30 minutes later. A shocked nation weeps. Across the country, around the world, disbelief was the first reaction. Then a great outpouring of grief, shock, and revulsion. 90 minutes after the attack, in a movie theater a few blocks from the scene, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested. Against the wall. All right, these, these people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Oswald worked in the book depository on the cavalcade route from which the shot had come. Equally as fast, aboard the jet leaving Dallas, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, standing beside Jackie Kennedy in her bloodstained dress, was sworn in as president. America was still in shock about the day's events when Oswald was shot dead on live television. He's been shot. He's been shot. Hey, Oswald has been shot. 48 hours and seven minutes after the president's death, his accused slayer is dead. The killer, a dance hall owner named Jack Ruby, was arrested, tried, sentenced to death, and died in prison. <laughs> 
Americans stayed home to watch the blanket television coverage on a national day of mourning following the tragedy, feeling the death of their leader and the loss of hope he had represented for their nation. How about you, sir? What is your reaction? He's the best man we ever had, believe me, and I'm very sorry. What was your reaction? Well, we were just completely shocked. I think that the American people have just suffered a great loss. It was just such a terrible thing. Their grieving was shared by much of the world. Less than three years after taking office, his body was brought back to Washington to lie in state. And the world mourned for a man who had given the world new hope. The confusion that swept over the nation as America tried to understand each piece of the news in this short period has fueled conspiracy theories ever since. This man, Mark Lane, has been asking for a fresh inquiry. He's always claimed that five bullets were fired, at least two of which came from the front, which means at least two gunmen and therefore a conspiracy. The more we know now, the more likely it was that Har Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. But 50 years of uh, less than conclusive evidence breeds conspiracy ideas and there are always books and films to be made on who killed JFK. Shockwaves from the Kennedy assassination continued throughout the 20th century. The feeling that something was being hidden, the mystique of the Kennedy clan, the allure of Jackie all remained prominent. Whether John F. Kennedy as a president would have defined the age in which he lived will never be known but his death is one of the great punctuation points of this century. On a June morning in 1914, a shot was fired. It would begin a chain of events that would lead to one of the bloodiest conflicts in human history. At the start of 1914, much of the globe was divided into spheres of influence. In each sphere was one of the great empires supported by a complex system of alliances. On the morning of the 28th of June, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the great Austro-Hungarian Empire, was visiting the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. It was not a popular visit, a Serbian-backed Bosnian independence group, the Black Hand, planned an attack. When the Archduke's car paused to change gear outside a cafe, a Bosnian nationalist, Gavrilo Princip, stepped from the crowd and fired shots that killed the Archduke and his wife Sophie. From a pistol shot at Sarajevo, the first of the great modern world wars exploded. The first thing that the assassination did, of course, is force Austria's hand. Austria needed to react. The intention is to punish Serbia. The question is how do you do it? And, and if you do it, there's a danger that Russia, who is allied to Serbia, will respond. And so they needed German support. They went to Germany and they said, look, we're, we're planning to take action. Will you support us? Germany gave effectively a blank check saying, whatever happens, even if Russia goes to war with you as a result of this, we'll support you. Austria declared war on Serbia, who called on Russia's support and the old system of alliances came to life. Russia called on its ally, France. Germany, to confront France, invaded Belgium, whose neutrality had been pledged by Britain, and she and her empire entered the conflict on August the 4th. The world was at war. The Great War, the war to end all wars, unleashed a scale of conflict and devastation unprecedented in human history. War. It seemed as though the whole earth had gone mad with the spirit of bloodlust. Human life seemed as nothing, the cheapest thing with which to satisfy the insatiable hunger of the gods of war. It was also the first war that uh, civilians were actually targeted uh, behind the lines by bombers. This was the first war where you, you had aeroplanes. Cities were bombed in the UK. London was bombed by Zeppelins. We bombed German cities. And so it was the first time really the whole of the population were drawn into the business of war. For since history began, the gods of Mars had never given humans such incredible powers. Never had war taken such a devastating toll. The war 
that it happened in such a sudden and seemingly careless way that a century later historians still argue about its causes. It did much more than change military tactics. It changed the map of the world and the balance of power permanently. In 1917, the United States of America entered the war. And when the war was over, it having impoverished the great states of Europe, the USA found itself the wealthiest and most powerful nation on Earth. Russia imploded after disastrous campaigns on the Eastern Front. The Romanovs, who had ruled for hundreds of years, were gone. The revolutionary government was overthrown by the Bolsheviks and they made peace with Germany so they could focus on the civil war out of which would come the USSR. The Ottoman Empire fell, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dismantled and Germany was defeated. Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated, an armistice was signed and the guns finally fell silent on the 11th hour of the 11th of November 1918. German troops were still on foreign soil, and they were unwittingly setting the scene for the rise of the dictators barely a decade later. Could all that be because a teenager named Gavrilo Princip emptied his revolver on a Sarajevo side street? You could argue that the First World War and the conditions of peace uh, in the 1920s and 1930s led directly to the Second World War, and that, of course, led to the Cold War. And ultimately, really, a lot of the situation, geopolitical situation we find in the world today, you can trace all the way back to the First World War and the assassination that caused it. From a prototype built in a garage would come one of the greatest technological revolutions in human history the rise of a device and a company that would forever change the way we communicate. The word computer was first used in the 17th century to refer to someone who performed calculations. By the Second World War, machines like Colossus were being used to break enemy code and read encrypted messages. 2,000 electronic tubes, several thousand relays, 150 motors, and about 200 miles of wire are contained in this intricate apparatus. These were large, static machines that weighed tons and occupied entire rooms or buildings. First transistors and then microchips saw the development of smaller, faster, more productive machines. In the 70s, the silicon chip became the basis of a new generation of computerized devices that looked sure to create a social and industrial revolution as profound as that of the first machine age nearly 200 years ago. Photocopier company Xerox created a prototype in 1973, an individual unit that had mouse control, a graphic user interface, and an ethernet connection. Xerox Alto, that's the computer that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates looked, uh, saw to get their idea, their visions for Apple and, and Microsoft. Just before the release of the Apple I, personal computing was a, essentially a hobby activity for a group of, you know, kind of dedicated electronic hobbyists. And the Apple I really changed that aspect of personal computing. First demonstrated in May 1976, the Apple company sold the Apple I for $666.66 before replacing it in 1977 with the more practical and user-friendly Apple II. And when you look at an Apple II, what you're seeing is a fully finished example of industrial design. It, it is a packaged commercial product ready to go to the consumer. It's got a built-in interface keyboard. It can it could be hooked up to a color monitor. And that actually became an industry standard then for a lot of business applications and really set the tone for personal and business computing uh, afterwards. By the 1980s, Computers were sophisticated enough to hide their complex technical aspects behind a user-friendly interface. 
Individuals could afford and understand computers. And the revolution was reaching every town, home, school, and workplace. Now, when I was a boy, uh, an apple was something you brought the teacher. Today, you learn on an apple. The computer essentially took all of the communications technologies and revolutions that had occurred in the 19th and 20th century and bundled them together in one box. Um, and I think it's really difficult to fully understand just what a great impact that's had on people's lives. But certainly in terms of the internet and the World Wide Web, that's had an enormous impact on society that, that we are still living today. The stage was set for computers and digital technology to become completely mobile. Work being conducted in the last few years of the 1990s at Apple created small, light devices with all the functions of the gigantic computers from the 1950s. We arrive at the age of the smart device we see how a 20th century revolution set up the dominant image of the 21st century. Almost a century after the end of the Civil War, inequality and racial segregation persisted in America. The civil rights movement needed a voice, one strong enough to make people listen. At the March on Washington in 1963, protesters from all over America came together against discrimination and segregation. They come by train, they come by bus and by air. They come from the north, the south, the east and west. Few realize that in a sense they are participants in an historical day. 16 speakers addressed the crowd, but it was the words of the last to speak that would resonate then and through the years. He was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Well, I think, first of all, that was his largest audience. I, I was among the people who were there, by the way, uh, in 1963. So it was, it was the biggest demonstration yet of, of the civil rights struggle. And, um, and Martin Luther King delivered the concluding speech. And the fact that he was selected for that role says something about his reputation as an orator. And there's a great swell of cheers to welcome Martin Luther King to the speaker's podium man who stands as a symbol of all they are fighting for. When he started to speak, King read from his notes. They were important words about the need for change. The prepared speech was really about the American ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that that should be the, the right of all people. His question then is, have we lived up to that? Then something changed. King all but abandoned his notes. He started to preach. When he finished that prepared remarks, then I think he, he felt there needed to be something more. And that something more was, if we do live up to that promise, he envisioned a world that was quite different from the world in 1963. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in King's intensity revitalized the sleepy crowd. His words infected them with his dream and brought me further to the cause. Because I have a dream. My four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. But I think what made the speech really special was that it, you needed to express a vision for what might happen if we did live up to those ideals and uh, give that dream, that uh, vision, uh, substance by uh, describing an America beyond race. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking of discrimination against African Americans, but the spirit of the speech endures because it can be used to defend human rights and the fight against any injustice anywhere.
King's galvanizing speech influenced the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Many of us who were there thought that the march was about getting the Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill through Congress. And he's saying, yeah, that's, that's important. But what's really important is realizing the basic ideals on which this nation was based. And his last book, um, Where Do We Go From Here, is written in 1967. So it's after the passage of major civil rights legislation. But he's still asking, well, where do we go from here? And I think we still need to ask that question. Where, where do we go from here? In the early 1900s, scientists and inventors were looking for faster ways of communicating across long distances. The result would usher in the age of broadcasting, bringing the world into people's homes, from sitcoms and soap operas to news on the hour. Inventor Guglielmo Marconi was fascinated by invisible waves and how they could travel. Guglielmo Marconi was a founding father of radio, who's an Italian inventor. He didn't invent radio. Um, you could say that James Clark Maxwell was invented radio by postulating that, that there were electromagnetic waves that travelled at the speed of light. And it was Marconi and others who learnt how to put signals on those electromagnetic waves. He was soon able to broadcast the waves up to several hundred metres. In December 1901, his team in Cornwall transmitted an S in Morse code hundreds of kilometres to the St John Signal Hill. Radio was born and quickly became a standard in seafaring vessels. It famously made news when a radio transmission alerted shipping to the fate of the Titanic, which meant saving 703 lives. Guglielmo Marconi, his famous signal CQD was the first used for distress calls. The Titanic was one of the earliest tragedies to be mitigated by his invention. As radio became established as in-home entertainment, audiences grew. Advertisers and more broadcasters followed. In the radio studios of America, the technicians, the entertainers, the commentators, the administrative personnel, daily unite their efforts in the creation of programs to please and entertain a vast radio public. It was the first mass medium that came into people's homes. It allowed people to hear events with far quicker lead times than the old days of newspapers. The king arrives at Broadcasting House and alone in a small studio makes his pronouncement in these memorable words. As more broadcasters took up their microphones, frequencies had to be allocated Interference decreased further as innovation modulated the airwaves. Scientific progression created a more user-friendly experience for the variety show, the discussion, and the radio play. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre Company dramatised the classics until their broadcast the night before Halloween in 1938. The company performed an adaptation of War of the Worlds. The War of the Worlds broadcast became very famous because it, it created a sense of panic, allegedly, uh, among large numbers of its radio audience. It was a radio enactment of H.G. Wells's famous book, done with voice and sound effect. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I, I've ever witnessed. Eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is a kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, those quiver and pulsate and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. The probability is that reaction to the broadcast was grossly overstated by the newspapers. That indicates that the growing popularity of radio was threatening the press, which hoped that publicizing such a sensation may provoke stricter government control of the airwaves. But it was too late. Radio was profitable and it was here to stay. <laughs> 
By about 1925, you could buy ready-made sets. You just plug them in or use batteries, switch the dial, put some earphones on or then a loudspeaker, and you could hear the radio. But it created also a broader accessibility to culture, to information, to news, to weather. It created an early form of our information society. Radio evolved over many years with the work of many inventors. From Morse code to radio plays, to presidential fireside chats, to news broadcasts, Marconi's invention became an enormous influence on the 20th century. Bacteria was once the scourge of mankind. Left unchecked, it would multiply until the human body could no longer fight back until a fateful discovery in a messy lab changed the course of modern medicine. The beginning of the story of antibiotics is disputed. It can arguably be attributed to the work of a man named Alexander Fleming. Its discovery, a result of his belief that lab cleanliness was a choice rather than a necessity. In 1928, Fleming's desk was a mess. Petri dishes spilled into each other, cross-contaminating their samples. He was working and looking at them, and he'd been sick that week, and he sneezed into his Petri dish. And so that plate's ruined, he puts it to the side, and he went off on holiday. And he came back from holidays and looked at that plate, and it was growing a whole bunch of mould. But around some of those colonies of mould, there was this blank space where no bacteria was growing because that mould was killing the bacteria. Fleming published a paper about separating samples and moved on. Like many discoveries, what Fleming noted lay dormant for 10 years until Howard Florey with fellow scientist Ernst Chain and their team worked to develop the miracle mould so that it could be put to medical use. What he knew was that he couldn't solve it alone. And so he did something that was really quite uncommon of the time. He pulled together people's expertise and information from this wide net of science and housed them under one roof. He had biologists, bacteriologists, pathologists, uh, clinical doctors, all different styles of scientists working on the one problem and then coming together and discussing all of their different parts of that problem together. And it was that collaboration that really created this world's first antibiotic. Unfortunately, Britain was not equipped for the necessarily high yield as their labs were tied up in the war effort. So Flory took it to the US. In June 1941, there was brought to the United States a tiny flask of the living mold. The altruistic men of science did not even patent their work before taking it across the sea. The Americans successfully improved its productivity. Through mass production methods, America is continually increasing its output of penicillin, the new drug that affects almost miraculous cures. The first trial on the infected cheek of Albert Alexander was a partial success. But unfortunately, the limited supply ran out and the 43-year-old policeman died from his wounds. Supply was still growing, but the war restricted its use to the masses of injured soldiers and cases where the treatment had failed. By the war's end in 1945, supply had vastly improved and restrictions were dropped. By the end of the century, the class of drugs had become so widespread that most people in the developed world will have been prescribed an antibiotic during childhood. Penicillin changed the world. It completely transformed our understanding and expectations of life and death. Women and children often died in childbirth. People who got pneumonia, a third of them would die. 80% of common infections that people got from scratches in their day-to-day -day lives went to quite serious infections and often death. So penicillin, antibiotics, revolutionised the way that people dealt with their day-to-day -day lives and their relationship with infections. 
other discoveries to come out of the original research had led to the development of more than 60 kinds of antibiotics, able to fight stronger strains of bacteria. As resistant strains evolve and mutate, the research continues in an unbroken line from Alexander Fleming's Petri dish. A nation divided by the color of its citizen skin. A blatant government policy of racial discrimination reviled and protested around the world. A change that many fought hard to achieve. One that was long overdue. South Africa's apartheid policy divided families, communities and the country into fragments. The word apartheid means apartness. In the context of South Africa, it was fused with this ideology of white purity and supremacy. The apartheid laws have been set up on the 1948 program of racial registration. The African National Congress, and then the Pan-Africanist Congress, initially protested peacefully, but were met with rifle fire and imprisonment. Notably, in the infamous Sharpsville Massacre of 1960. Apartheid remains rigidly enforced. There are over 12 million Africans to two and a half million white people. The shooting at Sharpville, in which many Africans died, shocked the world. It's evidence of the dangers of the situation. Soon, protesters became more active in their fight. Nelson Mandela led the armed wing Spear of the Nation of the African National Congress. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. He was involved in every protest uh, and uh, was an outspoken critic. And for this reason, was charged with high treason. Mandela would spend 27 years in prison, receiving worse treatment than the white inmates. His plight spurred the anti-apartheid feeling within the country and around the world, putting pressure on the South African government. Nelson Mandela in prison became a much more globally known figure than Nelson Mandela outside prison. And he was a very powerful contributing factor when it came to the downfall of apartheid. As the attitude of the rest of the world changed, policies towards South Africa hardened, both in trade and in sports. In Sydney, a force of 600 police prepare for a massive anti-apartheid demonstration at the South African Springboks rugby match. In 1989, the newly elected leader of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, recognised the change was needed or the Republic would collapse. De Klerk was saying, look, we can't carry on the way we are, otherwise we will implode. His government negotiated with Mandela through house arrest to his eventual freedom in 1990. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. Mandela lost no time in renewing his efforts to end apartheid. By this time, the South African government recognized that its policy was no longer tenable in the international climate. De Klerk began repealing the laws behind apartheid. The South African statute book will be devoid within months of the remnants of the racially discriminatory legislation which have become known as the cornerstones of apartheid. The immediate impact of the end of apartheid was, I think, one of relief. The rest of the world went, Phew. that's the end of that. I mean, this, this is a country that has pockmarked the entire 20th century. It's flown in the face of global opinion uh, and stuck to its guns with this vicious, oppressive, irrational system that is at odds with the rest of the world. 
The end of apartheid was also an end of a way of thinking, synonymous with the empires of the past centuries. In July 1993, the nationalist government agreed to an election including all races. You hold the future in your hands. In 1994, the Republic elected its first black president, Nelson Mandela. A new constitution came into effect in that year, finally ending the policy of apartheid. This is one of the most important moments in the life of our country. I stand before you filled with deep pride and joy. In 1917, two revolutions would bring down the Russian Empire in a matter of months. In its wake would emerge a completely new political system and a new global superpower. Imperial Russia, the champion of Slavdom, had entered the First World War in 1914. Success in battle was short-lived and military disasters were catastrophic and weakened the empire. By the start of 1917, Russia was gripped with severe shortages. If not teetering on the edge of starvation. So there was a loss of faith in the capacity of the Tsarist government and the Tsar himself to actually continue prosecuting a war that was coming at such extraordinary social cost. On the 8th of March, female Petrograd factory workers finished their shift and were forced to queue for bread that wasn't available. Their street protests attracted others, and by the evening, 100,000 workers were protesting and declaring a strike of their labor. 1917, a demonstration in St. Petersburg starts over a simple demand for a higher bread ration, gets out of hand, includes a new demand, transfer of power from the Tsar to an elected parliament, the Tsar reacts in customary fashion, turns his troops loose on the demonstrators, but something goes wrong. As the crisis escalated, Tsar Nicholas was forced to abdicate. The unexpected, accidental revolution created a vacuum, which an ill-prepared provisional government tried to fill. The inability of that provisional government to actually address the concerns that had brought about the fall of the, the autocracy in the first place actually sees the deepening radicalization of the ordinary people on the streets in the countryside. Conditions were right for another political group to challenge for power. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, observing events from exile in Switzerland, began to encourage his Bolshevik supporters to take advantage of the chaos. On the 7th of November, armed Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace, arresting the provisional government. They ousted it by virtually a, a bloodless insurrection. There's a very famous image, of course, and paintings and films made about the taking of the Winter Palace, but in fact, it wasn't quite as dramatic as all that. In fact, more people were killed during Sergei Eisenstein's filmed reenactment of the event. But it was an event that installed the new Bolshevik government, which began peace negotiations with Germany. Fearing the former Tsar and his family would be a rallying point for opposing factions, Lenin ordered the deaths of the royal family. By 1921, the Red Army had occupied all the independent republics of the defunct Russian Empire. In 1922, Moscow proclaimed the creation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics with the Russian Communist Party the center of power. I would say almost all of the major events in 20th century history have been in one way or other defined by what started out as a revolution in the city of Petrograd in 1917. Although Lenin had led his supporters to victory and created a new system of government, his growing incapacity from 1922 created an opportunity for someone to step up and assume the mantle. Not quite out of the shadows stepped Joseph Stalin, the one man Lenin had warned against. Lenin died in 1924. Under Stalin, the USSR would be transformed 
into one of the world's superpowers. Through the sacrifices of collectivization, the famines of the Great Leap Forward, and above all, through the war against Hitler, in which Stalin led them from disaster to triumph. The Second World War ended in Europe in May 1945. But it was still being waged on land and at sea in the Asia Pacific. Until a weapon of unprecedented power would be used against the civilian population, bringing the war to an abrupt and shocking end. The Manhattan Project began in 1940 with a deadly purpose. The Allies were pooling their resources to unlock the destructive power of the atom. Nuclear fission as a process was discovered in 1938. And just around the time that war was starting to break out in Europe, Albert Einstein and others drew the attention of, of President Roosevelt to the idea that the fission process might be used to produce a highly destructive weapon. After feasibility studies had been conducted, in 1941, Roosevelt signed off on the idea of a, a program to develop an atomic bomb. As the Japanese fought on, it was estimated that an American invasion of the home islands would cost more than a million American lives. No, the war in the Far East is by no means an easy affair. The cost in human lives is appallingly heavy. So the order was given and on August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. As they approach the target area, the weapon is checked for the last time. The bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, missed its civilian target, the Aoi Bridge, by approximately 300 meters. But it wiped out approximately 80,000 people instantly and destroyed most of the city. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many folds. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction. Those close to the epicenter of the blast were obliterated. In some cases, all that was left was a shadow burned into the wall and ground behind them. It's stone etched by heat, which reached thousands of degrees. A monument recorded the passage of the blast. And burned into the pavement was the silhouette of one of the many who perished on that fateful day. The death toll included 90% of the city's doctors and nurses, limiting the medical response to this new weapon. Another 60,000 people would die within months from radiation-related diseases. Three days after Hiroshima, the Japanese government, having failed to offer unconditional surrender, a second plane flew past cloud-covered Kokura to a clearer target. A few days later, the second atomic terror was loosed on Nagasaki. Although the end of Japan's aggression was in sight before atomic bombings, it was this terrific force that finally signed her death warrant. Six days after the bombings, on August 15th, the Emperor Hirohito announced Japan's unconditional surrender. Almost instantaneously, people realize that this is a very, very different weapon. And there is a realization that although people are, of course, happy that after the, the bomb has been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that the war has ended, there is also an understanding that if the Japanese surrendered as a result of this weapon, it must have been a very terrible weapon. Though the atomic bomb ended the Pacific War, it also graphically demonstrated the power of this new weapon. The power of the atom bomb was not theoretical. What had been made visible contributed to the deterrent effect that kept the peace between the world's two superpowers. Many people think that the development of atomic weapons and subsequently nuclear weapons has had a effect of actually ensuring against great power conflict or superpower conflict. Uh, it's certainly the case that Kennedy and Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis 
were led and influenced very much towards the idea that a solution would be better than warfare because they both had a quite strong impression of what, of what nuclear warfare would be like. The leaders of the two superpowers came close to the brink in 1962's nuclear standoff, but they didn't want to push the button on missiles being deployed. The bomb was never meant to be used again. You only really get to be unlucky once, and as we know, an awful lot of damage can result from nuclear emissions of the sort that would obviously result from, from, from the use of nuclear weapons. Fear remains of the deadly effect of the atomic bomb. Its capacity to unleash such devastation has created the idea of mutually assured destruction. With the spread of nuclear power to other volatile powers, that threat has not diminished. It began with a pledge that symbolized all the great hopes of the early 1960s. An idea that would take almost a decade to make reality. An achievement that would redefine our science, our technology, and our place in the universe. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift off on Apollo 11. Man is not made to go about being safe and comfortable. He is constantly being driven to do unreasonable things. Some force impels him, and go he must. H.G. Wells, author of The First Men in the Moon. Humans have always wanted this desire to conquest and explore new territories. This is why we do science, right? Is to understand the things we don't understand. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. When Kennedy made his pledge to reach the moon, America was the underdog in the space race. They would recruit 400,000 scientists and technicians in an effort to be the first to reach this important milestone. Work that culminated in the launch of Apollo 11 in 1969. The Apollo preparations have been the most comprehensive of any one enterprise in the history of man. The world watched as multi-stage Apollo 11 launched from platform 39A at Cape Canaveral. Three, two, one, zero, liftoff. What made it significant about the Apollo 11 moon landing is that it's an event that the world watched together. The international satellite system had been put into place just beforehand and the whole world, wherever you were, as long as you had access to a television, could tune in and see this event happening all at the same time. Almost everyone who could gathered around television sets in schools, homes, workplaces and public spaces to see Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin leave the Eagle Lander to walk on the moon. OK, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I think to think about the Apollo landing, you also have to think about the world at the time. You have the Cold War going on in the US, you have civil rights movements, you have quite a bit of turmoil. And here, the whole world paused and was saying, this is something that humanity has done. Armstrong and Aldrin were on the surface for about two hours, taking measurements and collecting samples. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. Besides being an inspirational moment in, in landing humans on the moon, it did have actually profound scientific impact. But we now know the moon is drifting away. We now know our days are getting longer. We have to fundamentally correct for this in our time. The understanding that the moon probably came from the Earth with an early collision between Mars or something like Mars and the Earth was because we had lunar rocks. The moon landing had given mankind the understanding it needed for future innovation. Many breakthroughs followed in the Apollo program. The, the technology involved, while the computer power is less than a modern day iPhone, it was a distinct change in how we analyzed data, communicated with space. So the, the knockoffs and the propagations of all of these scientific questions and discoveries, because we did something we never thought possible, opened up a new world. So it was a, a, a marvel uh, of the 20th century. <laughs>
the science of Apollo is not merely concerned with samples from past milestones, yesterday's missions. In a special room in Houston, men sit at consoles and command instruments on the moon to send them today's data. But one could argue that the real significance of space exploration is the perspective it's given us back on our own planet. It's the astronauts who travel to the moon who take photographs of, of this small, fragile, rather beautiful looking planet. And in some senses, it's that perspective that people are more attached to. The moon landing demonstrated momentous advances in science and engineering, which continued to propel us into the 21st century. It was an unparalleled feat of human achievement that brought the world together. When people try and say, do you remember that moment? They say, it's like the Apollo 11 landing. This is a moment that people use as a measuring stick. I think that in itself is the answer to where we view this as, and it will be. People are gonna be like, oh, this is our generation's moon landing. That's what someone's gonna say. This is like what they experienced in 1969. It is the measuring stick to all other events, and that by itself has to say it's one of the most influential events of the 20th century. The moon landing changed our sense of ourselves and of our planet. Who we are, where we are, and what we can do. It was, as the first man famously observed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.